Welcome everybody to Talks at Google. We are so happy to have you here. We're very happy to have our guest here, our esteemed guest, Scooter Braun. Uh, Scooter is one of the biggest entrepreneurs and, inter and innovators in entertainment today. Uh, he started as a teenage party promoter. He was the biggest college party promoter uh, uh, in Atlanta while going to Emory. He leveraged that into a director of marketing position at So So Deaf in its heyday. Uh, he left So So Deaf, uh, found a, a little known artist named Justin Bieber, uh, and then basically leveraged that into creating uh, the largest uh, or one of the largest media empires uh, in, in music and entertainment today. Uh, SB Projects covers all media, it's not just music, uh, so he obviously manages artists like Kanye West, Ariana Grande, Justin Bieber of course, uh, uh, EDM acts like Martin Garrix, uh, and then you know models like Carly Kloss. Uh, it also has a tech incubator arm called S Silent Labs, we were just talking about it earlier. They have really impressive investments in Uber, Spotify, Waze, Pinterest, to name a few, so his track record there is uh, pretty impressive. Uh, and he's also all about giving back, so he's on the uh, uh, board of directors of his brother's foundation, Pencils of Promise, as well as his wife's uh, foundation, and uh, I don't think we're allowed to curse here, so... Fuck cancer. There you go. <laughs> he went for it. I don't work uh, here. And, and, and that's his wife, Yael Braun, um, also very impressive in her own right. Please give it up for Scooter Braun. Thank you so much for coming. Awesome. So I actually want to start uh, with your childhood and just set a little context. And I want to start with a, a, a movie you made, a student film. Uh, when you were in high school, you made a movie about the Jews of Hungary, and this had a special kind of place in your in your heritage. And you actually got some recognition from Steven Spielberg on it. Is that is that correct? Can you can you tell us that story? Um, I I went to school, and uh, my teacher in middle school said, "There's something called National History Day, and no one from our school has ever you know gotten to nationals. But if you get to nationals, there's an all expense paid trip to Washington D.C." And I really wanted to go to Washington, D.C. I wanted to see the monuments. I wanted you know, to see everything I'd seen about it. So I went home that day and I said, Mom, I'm going to Washington, D.C. And she said, you're crazy. She goes, what are you talking about? And I came up with this idea. So my grandparents are Holocaust survivors. My grandmother was uh, liberated from Bergen-Belsen and was in Auschwitz. And my grandfather was in Dachau. Um, and I was always kind of fascinated by the story of how they could just live in this country and live a normal life like I was living at the time. And then suddenly their country just betrays them and you know everyone in their family dies and they're the only survivors. Uh, so I decided to do a 10 minute documentary called The Hungarian Conflict. And it was a, the story of how um, hundreds of thousands of Jews were deported over two weeks voluntarily by the, the German people and the German army towards the end of the war. Um, and submitted it, won uh, regionals, won states, uh, lost in nationals to a documentary about airplanes that make loud noises and fly over a neighborhood in Chicago, um, because that is the most important topic that can be a story about the Holocaust. Uh, I'm not bitter, I'm 36, I've let go of it. Um, and, but actually I had an amazing time, I got to go down there, I made a lot of friends, and uh, I was 13, 14 years old. And when I came back, um, my other grandmother, my mom's mother, she was very proud and she sent it into the Holocaust Museum and somehow someone uh, got it to Steven Spielberg. She had sent it to his office, everyone else, because he had the Shoah Foundation. He was collecting information about Holocaust survivors at the time. And I had no contact to entertainment. No one in my family had a contact to entertainment. We knew no one in the world I'd now work in. And one day in the mail, I get this letter from the office of Steven Spielberg and a letter um, typed out on his letterhead, signed by him, talking about my film and encouraging me to keep going. And I framed it, and it's been on my wall ever since. When I went to college, it was on my wall. It's on the wall in my home office now. Uh, and it made me believe that I could really achieve anything. Like if a kid who had no context could get to Steven Spielberg, I, I thought, you know, anything is possible. Uh, and funny enough, um, about 17 years later, I was at the White House press dinner with a client, and they moved us into a private room uh, with celebrities, because they didn't want the press just hounding these celebrities in the big room before 
the event with the president started. And Steven Spielberg was in the room and he started talking to us and I said, listen, I don't mean to interrupt, but I just need to tell you, years ago when I was a kid, I did a video about the Holocaust and you, and before I can get a word out, he goes, you didn't do the Hungarian one, did you? Wow. And um, he remembered 17 years later and I was completely in shock and it's just a testament to who he is and how genuine he is. And it was just very encouraging. I still have it on my wall uh, to this day. You mentioned something pretty remarkable, which is that you started off knowing no one in entertainment. Now you know everybody in entertainment. So if the first inflection point was kind of Steven Spielberg giving you recognition and that giving you kind of the just the belief in yourself to do anything after that, a second inflection point is, you know, cut to Atlanta. Uh, you're throwing parties for, for rappers like Ludacris and Eminem. How exactly did that come about? Um, Atlanta's, and Atlanta was racist. And that's the reason it happened. I, uh, I went down to Atlanta to play basketball and broke my dad's heart because I took a D3 offer instead of a D1 offer because D1 said, hi, you're 5'11 and can't really jump or run that fast. So nice jump shot. You're going to sit the bench for the first two years. And I didn't really like that. So I was like, okay, I'm going to go play D3. I'm going to get you know come out and start and get playing time. And I got down to Atlanta and no one cared about our team. And my best friend was at Duke. And he was the star of that team. And uh, we played AAU basketball against each other. So that's how we knew each other. And um, when I got down there, because I came from an AAU basketball team where I was one, I, I was a minority on my team. I was one of three white guys on a majority black basketball team. And our team, since we were 14 years old in our state, we every weekend, three to four months out of the year, we were in hotel rooms together as brothers. I mean, these guys are still to this day my brothers. I have to explain to my wife when one of them calls, like, well, I've never even met this person. You're just going to let them sleep in our house? And I you know, said, in my childhood, this is, this is family. Um, so when I got to Atlanta, I didn't really have that perspective of white people went to clubs that played techno, and black people went to clubs that played hip-hop, and there was no mixing. So I didn't like that, and I saw an, op excuse me, I saw an opening, and I needed, uh, I needed legit money um, because I was broke, and uh, selling fake IDs was not a long-term plan. <laughs> um, so I stopped by this club called Chaos in Buckhead uh, back in the day, and I said, if you let me bring people here, would you pay me? And he goes, well, how many people can you bring? I said, how many do you hold? And he said, 800. I said, that sounds about right. <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. I went to Kinko's. I made flyers. I named my company Kryptonite Entertainment because I like Superman. <laughs> um, and... Uh, I had a bunch of freshman girls pass out flyers for me because I had a high school sweetheart. Yeah. So the freshman girls weren't threatened by me because I would dance and have fun, but I wasn't trying to sleep with them because I was loyal to my high school sweetheart. And uh, where the freshman girls tell you to go, it seems like the rest of the campus went. Um, and next thing you know, I had 800 people there. And this is a long story, but uh, sorry for taking so long. That's At that awesome. first party... Um, someone approached me, and he was like, this party's amazing. Look at all these, these kids, different diversity, you know, listen to hip-hop. And I looked at him, and I was like, you're Michael Jackson. And no, it was not Michael Jackson, but it was Jason Weaver who played young Michael Jackson in the VH1 <laughs> movie that I would watch every single year when they'd play it about the Jacksons. And he was like, yeah, I'm, I'm on a different TV show now. That was like 10 years ago, dude. And um, he said, do you want to see how the other half lives? And I said, what do you mean the other half? He goes, black people. And um, he took me to Velvet Room on a Tuesday night. Uh, this, this guy <laughs> remembers old Atlanta. <laughs> okay. So the original Velvet Room. And um, there's a guy named Alex Gidewan, who is now one of the biggest club owners in Atlanta, who originally started off as an Ethiopian immigrant parking lot attendant. And at that point, he had become a huge promoter. Uh, and he had a stutter, still does. And he was so fascinated that I was there that he said, l -l 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 let the white boy in. <laughs> and he let me in for free instead of paying the $100 a head <laughs> cut line charge. Um, and I would put parties on every Thursday for college kids and spend every dollar of it on Tuesdays meeting people, basically faking it till I made it. Um, wow. And then I bought, I made so much cash with the parties 
because Alex really taught me how to promote. I learned what I really deserved to make at those parties. I started making the door a part of the bar, and he educated me. Uh, and I bought a purple Mercedes with rims on eBay cash. <laughs> um, and I started driving that to the party so I could really floss and get everyone's attention. And they were like, who is this kid? And I was like, you should come to my parties. And I said, we're playing hip hop too. And I started getting basically all these rappers of Atlanta started coming to my events. And I wasn't paying them. They were coming for free and having a good time. And the first uh, artist I ever worked at my parties was... Um, a DJ in Atlanta called Chris Lava Lava who had an alternate personality named Ludacris. And he had a record called Throw Them Bows and that was the first record I ever worked. Uh, and that's how I kind of got on the scene. And then one day, um, Jermaine Dupri called me and he was, when he came to Atlanta, it was a big billboard, he used to say, welcome, the home of so-so deaf. And he was on top of his game. A lot of people don't know this, Jermaine Dupri is the only producer in music to have a number one on the billboard charts for 16 years straight. Um, Crazy. More than Quincy Jones. And uh, Jermaine asked me to come meet with him. And Jermaine is not uh, a tall man. <laughs> so we, we met, and his feet were dangling from this chair. <laughs> and he was talking to me, and I was just so fascinated. His feet didn't touch the ground. <laughs> um, and, uh, and he asked me to come help him run his company and do marketing. I was 20 years old, and I became the vice president of marketing at SoSodef Records. Amazing. That was a long roundabout way of answering one question. <laughs> no, that's he, by the way, he told me before we started that when it's about crypto, this place is packed. <laughs> <laughs> so should we just talk about crypto? <laughs> like we just, just, just put the word out. Just be like, yo, it's not what you think. It's not about, it's not about Kanye and Bieber. It's about crypto. Get in there right now. We're talking about Ethereum. It's getting crazy in here. <laughs> that's awesome. This is actually. This guy has tips. He's got information on quant stamp. <laughs> No, no ICO talk, unfortunately, but that, that was incredible. Uh, I don't think I've ever heard that story at that level of detail. So, uh, okay, so you're, you're you know, a director of marketing at SoSo Def. Uh, talk about your kind of uh, decision to leave SoSo Def, and then... You want the truth or the nice version? I want the truth. What do you guys want? What do we okay. want? Uh, <laughs> how many people see this? 700K subscribers. Okay, just us. Um, look, but, but you have final I, edit right. I, Jermaine changed my life because he gave me an opportunity, and he, and he knows this. I actually just was down in Atlanta, and we spent the night hanging out together. Um, I'm incredibly grateful to guys like him, Shaka Zulu, who was Ludacris' manager, who put me in, a guy named Shakir Stewart, who unfortunately is no longer with us, who brought me into the music game. Um, guys like Steve Rifkin, who gave me my first record deal for Asher Roth. Um, and and these, these guys really changed my life. But uh, at the time, I had all these ideas about social media and how to break acts, and Jermaine wasn't listening to me. Um, he was really focused on what he was focused on and just wanted me to kind of promote what he wanted. And um, I had to go to London for something, some other project I was consulting for. And while I was over there, I ran into Little John. And a lot of people don't know this, but for nine years, Little John worked as an A&R at SoSodef Records before he became Little John. And we started talking, and he said, don't take nine years. He goes, I wouldn't have become Little John. I wouldn't have had the success I'm having now if I took this long. And we had, you know, just had Yeah with Usher, and he produced that. We executive produced that album. Um, and that was really resonating in my head. And when I came back, I would say I had one foot out the door, but I was scared. You know, I wanted to chase my dreams. I wanted to pursue what I wanted to pursue. But I had built this identity at 23 years old over the three years I was at Jermaine, you know, almost 24 at that point. Um, and I was afraid of stepping away as much as I didn't want to be there because I think a lot of people, you know, you guys work for a company, so a lot of you probably have entrepreneurial spirits and want to do something, but there's something about the steady paycheck that's crippling. Um, and Jermaine's mother came into the office. She had an office. Don't ask why. Um, and for some reason that day she was just in a mood and wanted to tell everyone who worked there that her son doesn't need any of them and he makes all the money and all you people are just overhead. And I said, look, with all due respect, I have my own company and promotion separately for this, but I love your son, and, but I don't have to be here and I don't really appreciate you saying that. So could, you know, chill it a little bit. And I was being respectful and she looked at me and said something uh, that out of respect for him, I will not repeat um, because that's his mom. And, but it was disrespectful and and completely inappropriate and, and hurtful. 
and um, not just to me, but to people beyond me as an individual. And uh, I decided instead of saying something back, I just left. And when I got back to the office the next day and kind of calmed down, didn't worry about it, um, she had a letter in my mailbox firing me. Um, and But what killed me was it was signed also by him. So I went over to see him, and I'm like, what the hell? And he's like, man, it's my mom. Just give it two weeks, and I'll straighten it out. And that was all I needed to know. Uh, and I remember taking my car, driving over to Kroger by my house, sitting on the hood of my car and realizing, as scared as I was, this was the opportunity I actually really did want, and the universe forced it on me. Um, the universe has a way of doing that in your life. You're like, you, you, you really want to do something, and you're holding back, you're holding back, and then you think something bad happened, it's just the universe usually correcting something for you. Um, and that set me out on my own track, and I, uh, I'm grateful she decided to say some crazy shit to me. <laughs> Sorry, Google, for cursing again. <laughs> you know you can search curse words on Google, right? That's true. They do show up, and you yeah. can search them. Yeah. You guys actually don't block anything that you're saying you can't say. That's true. I actually don't even know what the official policy is. Well, my question is, yeah. is, you know, especially with so many languages you have around the world, yeah. I would challenge you right now with the cameras. I want you to pick any curse word you want, but I want yeah. you to say it right now because I want to, re I want to release this for you. I want to give you, <laughs> I want to give you this freedom back. So I'm gonna, we're gonna just count to three, and you're gonna say a curse word. I'm gonna say a curse word. Yeah, one, two, three. Uh, shit. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> that was very scary for him. And I want to let you know that you were let go about two seconds ago. Uh, uh, you realize I, I went for the most PG curse word. Yeah, it was, pretty, it was pretty weak, but it's cool. <laughs> All right, keep going. Th thank you for that, Scooter. Um, wow. Crypto. We're talking about crypto in here. That's right. Get in on. We got Scooter Coin is coming up, actually. Oh, hell no. <laughs> that one will not make it past the bubble. <laughs> Um, okay, so you leave So So Def, uh, kind of a, an abrupt ending there. Uh, talk about the time in between So So Def and finding Justin Bieber, and then how exactly you, f you found Justin Bieber on YouTube, right? Yeah, thanks, guys. Well done. <laughs> um, yeah, that worked out well for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> just a grown man in the middle of the night in his underwear looking at the internet. <laughs> Staring at little boys singing and <laughs> look at my life now. <laughs> I wasn't even arrested. It was good. Um, actually, I did get arrested. That's not true. I got arrested in Long Island for Justin, so maybe that was the reason. Um, got to ask about that later. Yeah, that, that was just a mall that things were crazy. I was the first arrest in U.S. history for refusing to tweet. Jesus. Yeah. Um, long story. We don't have to go there. You guys can look it up. My record's expunged <laughs> so I can get global entry again. It's awesome. <laughs> um, all right. In between, I, uh, I needed a calling card, so I went back to the original guy, Ludacris, uh, Bill O'Reilly. Um, he had said Ludacris is a gangster rapper, and, and you know companies shouldn't work with him, and suddenly companies believe Bill O'Reilly for some reason, and Ludacris lost all his endorsements, Pepsi, everything. Um, and I was like, if you guys give me a shot, I'll find you something. And he was in an amazing movie called Crash that was coming out. Uh, and my buddy knew someone at Pontiac and said, hey, they're, you know, maybe go there. They're doing the solstice. I heard they have a budget. So I called, pretend I was a uh, college reporter trying to do how do you guys do endorsement deals. And they told me the name of their agency. I went to the agency and said the same thing. I'm a college kid doing a report on this. Would you like to speak to me? And... Um, Got to the woman, said, look, there's no report here. This is what it's really about. She goes, I don't know about Ludacris. And I said, look, come to the premiere of Crash with me. And if you, you'll you see. And when she saw Crash and saw him in it, she said, I love this. And we did a deal for the Pontiac Sol Solstice. Uh, I took his song, Two Miles an Hour. Um, <laughs> I've never told this story. So this is, I'll never get another deal with Pontiac after I tell this. Uh, so like I said, I really have anything. Like I was kind of going week to week. Still started throwing parties again to kind of get paid. Um, and um, I got them to agree to let us shoot the video with one of our music video directors, and we would make a music video with the Pontiac Solstice and then give them 30-second and minute clips to actually make into their commercial. And it was a huge $10 million campaign, 
Uh, but the Pontiac at the time was still a prototype. Like they hadn't started sending out the actual cars. So if you know anything about cars, the prototypes are like $2 million each because it's not the actual car, it's the model. Um, so we needed it for the video. So they sent it bent down, and you're not supposed to drive it. It drives, it's a car, but you know, it's a $2 million prototype car. But I didn't have money to put it on a flatbed and take it across town. So I drove the $2 million car down the highway, <laughs> literally like freaking out the whole way, <laughs> and got it to the video. And to this day, no one knows I did that. Um, <laughs> but now 800,000 people just found out. Uh, and that was kind of my calling card. And people were like, this is before Jay-Z had to deal with Nike. And you know, rappers and hip hop didn't really have endorsement deals. So people started hearing about the fact that I was able to pull it off. And then um, I did a party for him. Uh, for the anger management tour with Eminem and got Showtime to sponsor it with their show Soul Food. And I kind of started using this as a calling card and I was doing consulting and marketing for hip hop and R&B acts all over Atlanta and then around the industry. And I decided I'm gonna start my own company because I have all these ideas about social media and I found a kid on MySpace named Asher Roth um, who didn't even have a mixtape out, but I just liked his lyrics. And I had an idea about, you know, a a part of rap that is very common now, but wasn't being represented at the time. Um, Cause you had Eminem and that was just it from, you know, white boys. Uh, and flew Asher down to Atlanta, got him to move onto my couch. And we just started that process. Then I got him a house around the corner that was like filled with rats <laughs> and got my old college DJs. When I was a big party motor in college, they were two guys that were um, going to Clark and, and Morehouse, and that was DJ um, Drama and DJ Cannon. And they had become big mixtape DJs, so I got them to do a mixtape for Asher because we kind of came up together. And when Asher wrote I Love College, four months after finding Asher, I found Justin on, my, on YouTube, flew him and his mother down on the first plane ride either of them had ever been on, put them illegally, uh, Donald Trump, into, um, <laughs> into a house. It's Canadians, he's not as threatened. <laughs> um, uh, we'll talk about all that later <laughs> and, and uh, had them living around and when we wrote I Love College Justin was actually sitting there as a 14 year old kid and um, it was kind of this little family unit that we had um, and uh, since I see like a lot of young people here uh, it's strange I didn't know Google had so many young employees <laughs> uh, it just it's so against your reputation <laughs> um, and he, when I was 25, I had Justin living in a townhouse under my name with Aaron's Rents Furniture that I bought, um, and Asher living in a house around the corner from him in this decrepit, rat-filled house with his buddies that just came with him and dropped out of college with him, um, and I had my apartment, and I had money for 13 months before I went broke, and I wasn't doing parties, I was... Pot committed, I was in it, burned the ships, I was there, and that was that. And I was in a month 11, and my dad called me just to kind of check up. And I remember being 25 and just breaking down hysterically, crying on the phone, saying I'm a failure and nobody in Atlanta knows. Everyone thinks I'm killing it, everyone thinks I'm doing it, and I'm two months away from losing it all, and I haven't done anything with, you know, for these guys yet. And he goes, well, you've come this far, two more months, let's see what happens. And the next day, Asher wrote I Love College. <laughs> um, and within the two months, I was able to pull off hyping a publishing deal at South by Southwest. Um, I had one publisher meet me at a restaurant across the street from the other. So I made sure they saw each other and created a bidding war. Uh, got Asher a million dollar pub deal, took the commission to that, saved my company, and never looked back. And that's, that's pretty much the way I would describe to you. That's how close failure and success actually are. There's a very fine line, and to get to success, you have to walk right next to failure. And I'm, I've paid for pizza with change. I've cried on the phone at 25 years old. And it's funny, actually, think I'm 36 now. It's been 11 years, and my life is very different. Um, but, and I'm glad I learned that lesson. This is awesome. This might be the most candid interview I've ever given, so I appreciate it. Am I better answers. than my brother? Yes, I don't know. I can't. No, I can't take yes. sides. You said yes. It's on record. <laughs> sorry, on record. Adam. Adam, if you're watching, I'm sorry. Adam, you did great. 
He 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 interviewed my brother in SF last week. Last week? A few weeks ago. A few weeks ago. My brother's very impressive. He's mom's favorite. <laughs> I'm older. He's a lot more impressive. Uh, if you guys could look into Mission U or Pencils of Promise or the fact that at 32 he was the UN Global Education Crisis Committee head. Um, yeah, he's like, yeah, he's like that guy. 100%. Mom, mom loves him. And my sister, mom loves him even more than <laughs> It's not even close. He says he gets very competitive with you in basketball. Yeah, I mean, our dad's a coach. I didn't so know that. we like grew up playing competitive basketball our whole lives. And Adam is a better athlete and definitely has a better handle. Um, but his jump shot's weak. <laughs> and I, I definitely have the best jump shot in the family. He won't contest that. But that's all I got. Taking shots. But it's real. And that's good. And as you get older, like, my game is more efficient. Because as you get older and you have a jump shot, you can survive three-point line to three-point line. I like how there's, like, three people in here who are basketball fans. And everyone else is just like, <laughs> get back to the Velvet crypto room. talk, bro. Get back to the crypto. <laughs> we have more Velvet Room goers than, than basketball fans. Uh, okay, so that's, that's crazy. It's almost like... Uh, Asher gave you the runway to do what you did with Justin, which is maybe a little known uh, fact, which is that, that's pretty incredible. When you when you saw Justin uh, on YouTube, you flew him out, you flew him and his mother out and you got this this trial period and you got them to take a chance on you. How did you know like that this kid's special just from seeing him, you know, on, on, on YouTube? You know, an, a manager um, of a great new rising artist actually came to see me last night at my house. And it was our first time meeting and kind of just wanted to get to know each other. And we were talking. He's a really good dude. And we were talking about, you know, data and different things. And I just looked at him. I said, look, I remember um, when Sean Parker woke me up one night to tell me that he was going to create an algorithm for a hit song. And, you know, it's not the first time I'd heard something like that. You know, when you ask me how did I know, I like going with gut. That is a great thing, but going with gut is a much better way to live. And if everybody could take data and figure it out, then then there would not be, you know, hit songs. There wouldn't be, you know, movies. There would there wouldn't be innovation. We would just be following data and following some kind of timeline of how we're supposed to do things. And then, uh, you know, there's no there's no sensation of discovery. And I think data is very important because you can learn from it and you can go with it. But if you go through life, I mean, everyone in this room will understand this. If, if someone gives you a ton of data, but your gut just tells you it's wrong, but you follow the data and it's wrong, you're miserable. You are like, I knew it. I absolutely knew it. This drives me crazy. But if you go against the data and you follow your gut and you're still wrong, you actually don't feel bad. You're like, you know what, I tried, I went with my gut. And what's the point of really doing anything? The real point is being content and finding happiness. Um, because you can win 100 times and not find happiness and then be even more depressed. So I just think going through life and going with gut is the best thing. And when I saw Justin, my gut went off. And I actually saw from start to finish how to take this kid on YouTube. That When I showed other friends, they were like, cute kid, but I don't get it. I knew exactly how to make him one of the biggest pop stars ever. Like, I, it just, it all, like, yeah. flew in. And I am a spiritual person, so I think it was someone upstairs that kind of gave me that plan. Um, and and then I used data. Then I used YouTube. I knew I had to convince people who didn't think the way I thought. So I was like, okay, I'm going to use the data from YouTube and the analytics that YouTube's now sharing with me. And, you know, and I'm going to prove it to the naysayers of I'm going to take him some 60,000 views to 66 million. Hear that? By the way, I, my nose is itching like crazy. And in Los Angeles or New York, when you itch your nose, people completely get the wrong idea. <laughs> so I just want to say I live a healthy life. I just, I just have some allergies. That's, that's it. I'm not, I'm not that entertainment guy. I just want to itch the nose. Scooter that's, is sober and lucid right now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Very honest. Very honest. <laughs> the only way to go through life. Uh, wow. Uh, Ariana Grande, in my mind, is probably the closest thing we've seen to Mariah Carey since Mariah Carey. Mariah Carey was a so-so deaf artist back in the day. Um, talk about how you met her and, and got her to sign on board and then your journey with her. She was never so-so deaf. Just he, Jermaine produced her album. Oh, I didn't he know He produced that. Emancipation of Mimi. The Velvet Room guy knows, too. <laughs> okay, I wasn't going to correct you, but I was like, 
No, I'm going to correct you. You know way more about this than me. Uh, okay. Got it. Um, it's in a big mistake. We're going to keep going. <laughs> but how, how did you meet Ariana? How did you get her to, how did you convince her to sign on board and then, and then talk about the journey because she, she left and came back? Um, I saw Ariana on YouTube do a cover of a Justin Bieber song while she was playing a secondary character on a Nickelodeon show. And I was blown away by her voice. Uh, and I was like, this girl's a star. And I wanted to meet her, and I couldn't really get to her. And then I saw that she wanted to make music, so I reached out to a buddy, and I was like, look, I know I might be a jerk, because now she's wanting to make music, and I've never reached out before, but I've wanted to for a long time. And it turned out that she had been wanting to meet me for a couple of years, and people that she was asking to set up were kind of blocking it, because they didn't want me in. They wanted to be in. And uh, we met and completely hit it off. And I said, let's do this, and went on this amazing uh, run. And what, what shocked me is that um, Nickelodeon had a deal with Sony. And I was like, how are you not signed to Sony? And it turns out she said, hey, I want to make music. And they heard her sing, and they were like, well, she's not a star. We're not going to give her a record deal. And Sony actually passed on Ariana. Um, their loss, our gain. <laughs> um, and we did the deal, and we started working together, and we had two number one albums. Uh, and as you can see on the stage, I don't really hold my tongue. Um, and, you know, there were some other people in her life that were um, kind of, as you become more and more popular and famous and more success, people just start showing up and they want to create dissension because they want to create opportunities for themselves. And there are people who are creating dissension between she and I. And instead of just kind of succumbing to that, I you know, said what I felt. And um, in that confusion, we went separate ways. And uh, six months later, when those people showed their true colors, um, she called me up and she said, can we, can we meet? And we met up and we kind of stayed cordial. Um, and it was, it was nothing, it was a hug, forgiven, you know, for, forgave each other for anything that was said and back to it. And then we had incredible success, and then, uh, and and then I'm sure your next question is, we went through some really trying times together. Yeah, and talk talk about uh, switching switching actually to uh, to Kanye. Oh, I thought you'd uh, go there. Uh, well, actually, yeah, I should go there. That you kind of <laughs> teed me off. Well, uh, did, can you talk about those trying times, with Ariana? Look, it's yeah. Glad you asked. <laughs> um, I didn't see that coming. Um, uh, look, Ariana, very well known, had a terrorist attack at her show in Manchester. Um, and over 20 people were killed, including a nine-year-old girl and other kids. And, uh, and she was there. And these people were there to see her. And there's that guilt you carry when that happens. Um, and I was angry because of my grandparents being Holocaust survivors. I always knew that kind of evil existed in the world. Um, and I'd kind of waited my whole life for an opportunity to take it on. So I was like rearing and ready to go and filled with anger. And I was like, we're going to do a show. We're going to go back. And when I got to her, um, the next day, she rightfully so was torn apart. And she was like, I don't know if I could ever sing these songs again, let alone go on stage. Uh, so I had to kind of pull myself back and realize this wasn't a moment for me. Um, and I worked on canceling the tour, worked with their insurance team, and the insurance company was British, and they completely understood and actually said, we're going to pay the full fee for all her shows for the rest of the tour. We're going to fully cover the insurance. And think about that. So now she's getting her full fee, but she doesn't have to pay for production. She doesn't have to pay for the costume. She doesn't have to pay for staff. She's actually going to make more money by not performing for the last two months than she would on the wow. entire tour by just accepting the insurance. Um, and by the time I flew home two days later, I got home to 16 text messages saying, call me, call me, call me. And I called her up and she knew that financial point. And she said, um, if I don't do something, I'm not who I say I am. And all these kids who come and see me and all the things I tell them, they're not real. So what's the plan? And uh, I said, look, I." She goes, I'm ready to go on tour tomorrow. I want to go back. And I said, look, I think you need to take some time to make sure you're strong enough because I think you're excited right now. 
but let's go back in two weeks because that's Paris. We'll cancel six shows because you need time to heal and really you know, take this in. And Paris is where the Eagles of Death medal happened. And I thought that was a great statement. And I said, but I have a crazier idea. Before Paris, instead of waiting three, four months a year, we should go back to Manchester and perform. And she goes, do you think so? Why? And I said, because the reason terrorists do this is they want to change our way of life. They want to scare us. And the best way to stop it from happening again is answering right away and answering in defiance and letting them know they're not going to change our way of life. And she, without, you know, even pausing, was like, I'm in. And uh, we had two weeks. We put the show together. And I put a tremendous amount of pressure on a small Italian girl's shoulders. And, um, and she stepped up and she handled it. And there were a lot of amazing people who stepped up for that show. And that will always go down in my mind is the most important and most incredible show I've ever been a part of. To give you a little context, we finally got back to the UK. We were rehearsing the night before. Staying in Manchester, we rehearsed at um, Wembley Arena the night before. And that night was the night of the London Bridge attack. So the second terrorist attack happened the night before our show. Wow. Um, and that was the first time I was thinking, is my excitement and arrogance going to get people killed? And before I could even think about canceling the show, Chris Martin from Coldplay, who was in the show, sends me a text, please don't cancel. And then Marcus Mumford calls me, because I just see him at rehearsal, and it says, do not cancel. It's more important than ever that you guys do this show. Ariana, I never even talked to about. Didn't even go there. She had already gone to sleep. And uh, I spent the night, talked to her mom. We decided to go on with the show. And the Greater Manchester Police wanted me to release a statement um, on behalf of our team that the show was going to go on. I spent the whole night writing it, woke up, put it out, and I said that we have a greater responsibility now more than ever to continue on this journey, and you know, not only for the victims of Manchester, but the victims of London to honor them and be on that stage. Um, and then the Manchester police put out a statement saying the show will go on. However, please understand that the alert is now at high, which means there's, quote, likely going to be an attack. And wow. we were going to be on YouTube, thanks, uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Capital Radio, BBC Radio, and the BBC. So you could watch our entire show from your home. I was convinced no one was going to show up. And when Marcus walked out um, to open the show, the Mum Mumford guys had, weren't in town. It's the only time Marcus Mumford has ever performed without Mumford and Sons. And he did Tim Shell, and he changed a couple lyrics to honor the victims. And when he walked out, there were 60,000 people in the place. It was packed. And it was chills, because it was about to be a three, four hour show. And he and I talked beforehand about what, how to start it. And we asked for a moment of silence. And at the end, he said, let's not be afraid. And the place roared. And it's something I'll never forget for the rest of my life. That's incredible. That's awesome that you guys were able to stay the course and make it happen. Yeah, give it up. Okay, so uh, I want to talk about Kanye. Uh, you, you've had a relationship with Kanye for a while, but you signed him kind of later in his career. Uh, can you talk about uh, what, what Kanye means to you as, as, a, as a friend and as, and as a you know, colleague now? Um, and yeah, what the future holds for Kanye? Look, um, he is the most interesting person I've ever met in my life. Uh, he is a genius. And I've witnessed and experienced it. He truly is a creative genius. Because all my other clients, you know, a lot of it kind of comes on the creativity, the ideas. Like, a lot of it, myself and team members, like, it's on us to kind of come up with and then work with them. Kanye's always the person, he's like, yeah, I like that, but what about this? And you're like, damn, how did I not see that? <laughs> um, but he's even made me see colors differently. Like, I, I've, you know, we've spent so much talking about colors and palettes that I actually see colors and aesthetic differently because of his education of hours and hours and hours of conversation. Doesn't he have like synesthesia? Like, like yeah, sounds are colors. He, he, when he hears sounds, he sees colors. Crazy. Um, and we were friends for a long time. Uh, if you look up the ludicrous stand up video, I am the promoter, club owner, jumping around, dancing in it. And um, Kanye produced that song, and he makes a cameo in it. And we actually met then before he had just signed to The Rock, and he was a producer. 
And no one knew who Kanye West was other than, you know, if you'd worked with him as producer. And we met on that set and we're friendly. And kind of over the years, always knew each other. His original manager, John Monopoly, was always good to me when I was a younger guy. Um, and then when he put up a tweet saying he was $52 million in debt, he's my friend. So I texted him, are you okay? And um, I guess a lot of people didn't ask him if he was okay. So he called me back just to talk. And after talking for about an hour, he said, you know, you need to come work with me. And I said, Kanye, we've t we talked about this before. I, I don't want to do that. Like, I'm afraid of working with you because I don't want to lose the friendship. I, I love you, dude. No, no, you need to come work with me. You need to manage me. You know, I'm going to call Izzy. You need to manage me. And I said, no, 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 we're, we're good. Why don't we, when are you back? You're back in a week? Okay, you're back in a week. We'll talk about it then. And I thought this is like the eighth time he and I have had a conversation like that, like, we're going to get it. We'll stay friends. The next morning, I get a call from Adidas and Def Jam. So we're told you're the manager and to deal with you. And that is how I became Kanye West's manager. <laughs> um, but he's become like a brother. And, and I joke around that it's been two and a half years now. And, you know, I think we'll always be friends and we'll always find ways to work together because we both have this feeling of, like, art can change the world. Um, and I joke around all the time that, you know, I'm his manager today, but I might not be tomorrow. Like, I've lasted longer than most. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm going to be with him next week and saw him last week. And it's, he knows it. He's like, someday when you're older, you're going to say you manage Kanye West, and that's cool. And I'm like, it's cool <laughs> right now, bro. <laughs> I mean, we walked in, you were like, nice easies. I was like, you're goddamn right. <laughs> He's like, I got a hookup. Yeah. <laughs> but I, he, he really is a genius. And, and here's the thing I like to say about him publicly, because I don't like to talk about it too much publicly out of respect for that's not really his thing. Um, but Kanye West is the best listener of any artist I've ever worked with. That's incredible because I feel like that's the, probably the biggest public misperception. He, biggest misperception. Kanye wants the information. He wants to learn everything. If you interrupt him and say, hey, my bad, he goes, no, no, what did you want to say? He wants, he is the best listener of anyone I've ever worked with, hands down. And he's also someone who doesn't keep me on the phone. If I say, hey, my kid needs me, I'll call you right back. No problem. Like, he's actually incredibly, in his own way, empathetic and considerate and is a really, really, really good listener. When he gets frustrated, his passion might take over and he goes what I call full yay. <laughs> um, but he has a heart of gold and he really is an amazing listener and that is, yeah, I think 100% the biggest misconception. I'm going to name some people you've worked with and you just give me the first word that pops into your head, okay? Okay. Justin Bieber. Why did hair come to the first thing that came to my head? <laughs> no, that, that's, uh, that's family. Usher. Uh, sure. Also family. Um, brother. Carly Kloss. Kindness. Martin Garrix. Wild man. Blood pop. Martin's also jump into your pool. <laughs> Fully clothed. <laughs> um, blood pop. Uh, brilliant. The wanted. Hmm? The wanted. Uh, I'm glad you came. Uh, Kanye. Last one. Genius. Love it. <laughs> okay. You can ask Ariana. I didn't ask Ariana. Ariana. Brave. Awesome. Um, and it, it feels like right now you, you represent mostly pop, would you say? Uh, you, you came from a hip-hop background. Uh, yeah. Well, how, do you, how do you reconcile that? Do you want to, you know, do more hip-hop stuff? or? I am in business with more hip-hop people than I let know publicly. <laughs> and I am also in business with a lot of country music that I don't talk about publicly. Our, our company has... Um, a branch of it that owns a piece of a bunch of other companies within our business. So we own 50% of a lot of other companies. We just don't talk about it publicly. It allows me to touch other genres, be involved with other genres. Um, and, you know, we've done EDM, we've done country. Um, but there's people that, you know, they'll see me at shows and be like, I don't know, you're friends with this person? And, you know, sometimes I'm in business with them as well. But uh, it's funny because probably of any manager in music history, I've probably done, I've put myself out there probably the most because I thought it was a new world and, 
you know, if you can create a brand for yourself, then you can launch other brands. And social media was changing things. So I, I made a conscious decision to do that, knowing that it would put a target on my back and it would be something people use to criticize me and kind of judge my character and assume that, you know, people that don't know me, they might assume, oh, he's doing that because he wants to become a public figure or be consumed by that. And the truth is the majority of the successes we have, we'll never speak about. Um, and the majority of my public life, my private life isn't very public. I choose to like show my family in certain aspects um, publicly only because when I came into the industry, you know, fast women, fast cars was a stigma that you thought of when you thought of a successful entertainment, you know, man. And uh, I wanted to change that paradigm. I want, I want people to see me and I want them to know you can have success in this industry and be a good husband, a good father, a good friend, a family man. And I also think, especially with what I'm seeing now with Time's Up and the Me Too movement, that you know this movement can't just be about women. This movement needs to be about moving the needle on men in the industry so they treat women better. And, um, and I think the only way you do that is you, you move the needle on what a man's goal is. If you, if you tell a young man coming in industry that success doesn't look like that, that's actually not a good result. Success is being someone who's honorable to women and someone who's honorable to their family and honorable to their commitments of family then I think you're going to see more young, young men not acting so inappropriately and becoming like the generation that we're seeing fall right now. And, and that is something I, I want because I was raised by a strong woman and I married one. So, you know, I, I, don't, I don't want the next dude coming up looking at my success and thinking, oh, I want that car and I want, you know, that young girl. Like, no, that's not what it's about. That's actually, that's a very shallow life in my opinion. Sorry, I talked about this too long. Well, you're a good role model. No, that's great. Uh, you talk about a lot of your success going kind of unspoken and, 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 and unrecognized, or you kind of keeping silent about it. Fittingly, your, the tech arm of SB Projects is named Silent Labs. Can you talk about, you know, we, we were talking earlier, just the history of your involvement with tech to the extent that you can talk about that? Um, so the itch came because when I was a big college party promoter, Emory was one of the first eight schools to launch the Facebook. And I was like, what a great way to get my parties out there without having to hack the school database. Um, so I got in touch with the contact page and the master of dungeon ceremonies, Mark Zuckerberg, whatever the hell it said at the time. And he wrote me back, please talk to Eduardo, who I saw was the master of coin uh, or something like that. And... Um, Eduardo and I, for about four months, negotiated 10% of Facebook for $100,000. I still have the email. Dear Scooter, Mark wants to launch 32 more schools in two weeks, so unfortunately at this time he refuses to take any outside investment. Let me know if you're coming to Boston so we can catch up and see if there's other stuff we can do together. Now, I joke around in my head that I know I'm a closer. And if I would have gone to Boston, I probably would have closed that deal. But remember that high school sweetheart I told you about? Well, she ripped my heart out. And she <laughs> went to BC. <laughs> so the idea of going to Boston and running into her was not happening. So I was like, oh, man, screw this Facebook thing. I'll have to find another way to promote my parties. And a year le later, it was like Peter Thiel invests a million dollars for 10% of Facebook. And I was like, I could have made a million dollars. Um, That's an unprofitable breakup. Right yeah, there. and but I didn't know what it was going to be, so I can't claim credit. But when it continued to becoming this, you know, giant conglomerate, it made me say, "Well, there was something there," and it actually made me start investing in tech very, very early. Before, kind of the music industry in LA wanted to start going up to the valley, I started going up, and not really telling anybody because I didn't want anyone else going up. Um, so I was able to get in early in a lot of really amazing companies. And they were personal investments for me. And then we had our incubator if I wanted the company to invest as well. Um, but I was able to, you know, I went up and I was meeting with another company and they ordered me an Uber. And I'm like, what the hell is this? And they're like, it's a new thing here in San Francisco. It's really cool. <laughs> and then uh, a friend of mine said, hey, I met this guy, Travis. And I have this front, great picture of Travis in my living room here in L.A. pitching me about Uber coming to L.A. And I was already an investor when it was just in San Francisco. Um, and, you know, seeing that whole thing. And uh, then his competitor came up, which I got into also, which 
you know, made him mad at me for a little while. Um, but John Zimmer went to my high school. John Zimmer was the same age as my brother. He played soccer with my brother. And when that thing happened, um, at first it was Zimride, and I basically passed because I was an Uber guy. But later on, um, I had some frustrations, and I decided, you know, John, okay, you know, let's go do this too. And um, I was on a 30 under 30 list in Billboard when I was 27. There was a 24-year-old kid on the list. Uh, and I called up Billboard, Bill Wardy was the editor, and I said, can I have the name and number of every single person on the list? Because I feel like my peers are the people that I want to grow with, not somebody I aspire to be. Like, we're going to come up together. Because whenever you meet someone powerful, they say, oh, of course I know them. I'll call them. We've known each other 30 years. And you realize that the people sitting next to you when you're working your way up are the people that you actually are going to need when you get there. Um, so I called everyone on the list, and one of them was a, a young guy from Sweden with a startup that was just in Sweden. We became friends, and... Um, he let me invest in his startup called Spotify. Um, and, you know, along the way, different friends got me into different companies, and uh, um, it, it worked out. You, you make it seem easy, like you were, like, accidentally friends with all these. That's crazy. No, it, it, listen, I just think, uh, I don't really think I'm that good at this stuff. I really think I'm really lucky. Like, when I was a kid and I didn't do homework, there'd be like a freak snow day. Because I got a lot of friends who work really, really hard and they just can't catch a break. And I'm the dude who goes on the internet in the middle of the night, finds Justin, or my friend sends me a funny video of an overweight Asian dude dancing and I'm like, ooh, it's like the Macarena, I'll sign that. And it's Gangnam style. And like, you know, it's, uh, you know, the things that have happened to me in my career, it just doesn't really make sense. So I don't really think it's on me. I think somebody, I'm going to get real spiritual on you guys, but I actually really believe this because when you cry to your dad at 25 and then you wake up 11 years later next to who I get to wake up with, with my two kids and my life, you can't just sit there and be like, okay, this is normal. It's because it's not. So I believe that you get blessings to give them to other people. Otherwise, you stop getting them. That's actually my, my personal belief. And I believe as long as we keep doing philanthropy, as long as we keep giving back, as long as we wake up every day and find a way to make sure somebody else gets an opportunity, then somebody upstairs keeps opening the door for more opportunities. And that's just my personal belief. And there are really shitty people who get to win along the way. I'm not interested in, in like paying attention to them. I, we just got to do what we do. It's beautiful. Uh do you, have, do you have time for a couple questions from the audience? I got time for whatever. This is We didn't know how, what, how long this was going to be, and originally when we planned this, we didn't know we'd be in our new office in Santa Monica, so we thought coming out here was going to take hours. <laughs> so I don't really have anything to do for another hour. <laughs> so, uh, And Zach has my phone, so I have no idea how many clients have called while I'm up here, and I'm actually really enjoying the fact that I don't have a phone. This is like when I went to Burning Man. <laughs> Google Burning Man. Yeah. Uh, do, do you have anything? This is nothing like when I went to Burning Man. <laughs> <laughs> they do. They do say Burning Man is the new Davos, though. Like it's all just tech execs. So I liked it. I rode a bike around. I don't do drugs. <laughs> and for those people who have this stigma that you do drugs at Burning Man, not true. I don't do drugs, and but I do ride bikes. And I rode a bike around that desert like I was 15 years old at Bible Street Park. <laughs> My phone wasn't on. I was a wild man. I was riding that thing straight into the oblivion. And it was awesome. So if you like bike riding, I will tell you there's a great trail. It's called Burning Man. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna give. I'm gonna pass this mic around for audience Q and A. Um, before I do, do you have anything you want to like plug or promote that SB has going on? I'm good. You guys are Google. You don't need anything from me. You got a tea, tea shop in your office. <laughs> Fun. And feel free to pass it to the yeah. next part. Cool. Uh, Diana Scar, thanks for being here today. You are an amazing storyteller. I've learned so much just from listening to you. You've talked a lot about using technology like social media to discover new music and new artists. Thoughts on super new technology that could, that could potentially be used to discover new music like robots, self-driving cars, drones. And to give some context, I work at Google X. I'm just Blockchain. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> Blockchain, yeah. <laughs> um, technology has actually always shaped how we see the music industry. So, like, before Tesla um, really created what we know as radio today, 
there was no music industry because there wasn't a way to distribute. So technology actually was the creation of the music industry. And then if you look at, um, you know, whether it be vinyl and then the adaption to eight track and then CDs and, you know, cassettes and all these different things and then going to MP3 and now streaming, technology has always built, lifted and saved the music industry. Um, I have no idea what it's going to be next. I know that I think we're actually in the infant stage of streaming. Because if you actually look at it and we're like, oh my God, this person sold five million albums. That's mind blowing. But the amount of people on the planet that listen to music, that actually isn't mind blowing. We've never created a way where when there's such a great separation of wealth in this world to be able to distribute music properly amongst all people. And now we have streaming, which is changing that. Um, so I don't really know necessarily what's next. I know, I think we're in round one. I mean, it's, I think it's $8.6 billion that streaming is now creating for the industry, which has brought it back up to where it was and a little bit above. Um, I think we're in literally the first inning of a nine inning game of streaming. I think it's, it's going to take the value of music up in a way we haven't seen before. Um, and then I think as far as AI, that is the most interesting part for me because that's how we're getting a lot of this playlisting and everything else that's becoming so influential. But I still think it's missing the human touch um, because AI can kind of I identify what songs go together or how we put stuff together. But a human touch can identify a human's interaction with music in a timeline of life. Because if I say to you... Um, tell me what you were doing when you were 11 years old. You're probably not going to, you know, maybe there's something influential that happened when you're 11, but a lot of people are really like, I'm not really sure. But if I play you a really big song from that year, it's going to take you right back to when you were 11 years old. And there, there's something special that AI can't do about identifying that. Um, but also there's so many people we're going to need AI. Um, so I'm, I'm interested to see what someone like yourself comes up with next. And hopefully by the time you do, I will be out of the music industry. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good throw. So, uh, Scooter, uh, what are your thoughts on blockchain technology? <laughs> <laughs> um, my thoughts are block te te blockchain technology is amazing, and it's going to be innovative in 100 different industries. Uh, but coins aren't needed in every single industry. <laughs> um, so I think having a coin associated to every piece of blockchain technology is something that why 99% of the coins will disappear and the ones that make sense for the technology that they're associated with and make sense for the industry that they're going into will survive and those coins will be the Amazon of this bubble. Um, but I think that there's a very big difference between blockchain technology and cryptocurrency, in my opinion. And uh, I think that the actual use of blockchain, te blockchain technology, it, listen, if they can break blockchain technology, we're all screwed because that means that people can break our entire financial system. Um, but I think it's going to make all of our systems more efficient. Uh, but I think that people should start educating themselves on the difference between crypto and what blockchain is. and and actually understand that it's way too easy to make coins, and that's why most of them should disappear. But uh, until then, I'm going to have as much fun as you are. My <laughs> boat right in front of you. Oh, right there. Lucas. Scooter, this has been awesome. Thanks for coming. Um, you're a tremendously successful entrepreneur across a range of industries, tech, nonprofits, music, media. What excites you the most in your business? I'm really cheesy now that I'm a dad. Um, bedtime. <laughs> I mean, honestly, like, uh, I get excited by challenges and I get excited by insults. So when everyone is like, oh, you've done, you done so well, I get really bored because I don't know where to go. Insults have usually led me where to go because doing um, the unreasonable thing has always led to the great thing. Doing what everyone expects, the status quo, the reasonable, doesn't lead to any kind of greatness, doesn't lead to a good story. And I, and I always said I wanted to you know, be my own story instead of reading everyone else's. Um, but what gets me excited at this point, if, who here is a parent? Okay. So the people who raise their hand are going to get this. 
My kid, my three-year-old, woke me up this morning, slapped me in my forehead, and said, Daddy, I love you. So much better than a Grammy. Aww. So much better than, you know, an, I, an IPO. Of, you know, it's, there's no real describing it because you do all this stuff and you don't really understand. You're like, what am I here for? And then you have kids and then you understand what you actually are here for. Um, you have like a purpose when you have children that you just didn't have before. And there's no good time to have kids because you're always planning your life and seeing it through your own eyes. And then when they finally show up, you're like, I don't really understand what life would have been without you. Um, yeah, I know. I sucked. You guys are leaving. <laughs> you guys want to leave? Yeah, I know. I saw Dave Chappelle do this one time at a like, comedy store. He did like a secret show and people walked out and he did this. Everyone give him a round of applause because they hate me. <laughs> um, um, uh, <laughs> I like lost. What makes me excited is um, either the first time I do something, being with my family, experiencing something like that, or when someone I work with has a first. Like, if, if the first time I saw this guy, Mike George, who works for me, receive his first platinum plaque in our company, I had at that point in my career received a lot of platinum plaques. They're in the garage. Seeing him have the joy of that first time reminded me of what that felt like, and that gives me joy. So um, I'm kind of at a point now where I feel like my life is kind of absurd, and I have everything I've ever needed and a lot more. And I only got there because I stood on the shoulders of all these people that believed in me. So now it's my turn to kind of work for them and make sure I pull them up to where I'm at. Awesome, thanks. Uh, so what was your response when Kanye West showed a kind of support for Donald Trump? I disagreed. Yeah. I mean, it's... Here's the thing, living in Los Angeles, I'm really grateful that I lived in Atlanta, Georgia until six years ago. Um, living in Los Angeles and New York are, is amazing. And living in the state's amazing because it's probably the most forward state in the nation. Um, but we're not without fault. There's the largest separation of wealth in the country is in the state. And people acted like they lost their damn minds when he won. And to me, when he won, I didn't freak out because that's the process. Someone needs to win and then you're supposed to heal and come together. A lot of things that he's done since have disappointed me to a place that I'm not okay, but I was going to give him a chance in the beginning because um, I think that's the process. And if you don't, then you're a hypocrite. If you're, you know, because if, if Hillary would have won and they said, oh, we don't want to support her, we would have been yelling at them. Um, so when he felt that way, I said, look, that's your opinion. But I also felt like he was feeling that way when at a point where, you know, he was sick, you know, and I felt like, there were people around him, it was very frustrating. I thought we're taking advantage of a time where, like if you saw Quincy Jones' most recent interview, nobody should have let that person in the house at the time. Like sometimes people need to be given privacy just because they're public figures, they need to be given a moment to process. Um, but uh, I know his heart and I know that he's a human being that I don't always agree with, but I respect him and he, he said what he wanted to say and I'm allowed to have my own opinion. You know, just because I manage someone doesn't need, mean I need to agree with them. Me and Vic Mensa, who I manage, had a big disagreement recently. And I was proud that he put up on his Instagram, he said, I know Scooter Braun vehemently disagreed with me, and he's my manager, but I appreciate him at least having a conversation. I think we've messed up in this country and really around the world. We've forgotten how to speak to each other. And we're forgetting the same people we're yelling at are the people we're claiming that we're supposed to help. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to start having conversations out of respect again. Otherwise... Nothing is going to change. Cool. You got to throw it all the way over there. You have to throw it. Oh, good catch. I thought she was going to you. She went deep. <laughs> She's got a Kirk Cousins arm. <laughs> so first of all, I was a college student in Atlanta from 2002 to 2006, so I probably went to some of your parties and didn't even note it. Um, but. You mentioned about how you, when you have success, you get bored and you're kind of always looking for that next challenge. So is there something on the horizon for you that you feel like is some sort of like moonshot thing that you'll think you'll go after next? Or is it just going to be bringing up those people behind you and all of those things that are... I think it's a combination. If I want to bring them up, then I got to keep going. Um, so if, if the way I look at it, here's the challenge. I'm 36 years old. He's like, you got a cool story. If this is the end of my story, then I failed. Because I'm 36. The average entrepreneur hits their stride at 39. So to me, I'm just getting started. 
So I don't know necessarily what it is next, and I don't like talking about stuff before it happens, so there's things working on. But I also know part of my story is going to include failure because the last decade of my life has had so much success that statistically, if I'm really not being a moron and paying attention to a little data, statistically, I should have some serious failure on the horizon. You know, the Wall Street goes up, it goes down. There's always got to be a correction. So what I'm excited about is regardless of what that correction is, it's not going to stop me. It's just going to be a pit stop um, because now where the universe messed up is they gave me too much. Now that I got my wife and kids, I'm playing with house money. <laughs> so, like, you can't really take anything away from me. Like, if I lose some money or, like, lose some, you know, popular, you know, if, if I drop the ball on some naysayers who wanted to see me fail for a while, like, haha, I told you so, they're going to be super disappointed when they find out I'm not that upset. Um, but I'm just going to keep going and see where it takes me. And, you know, whatever comes next, I'm ready for it. And I, and I, I get bored, but I also, like, I'm a workaholic. I can't really shut it off. Like, the, the hardest challenge for me is work-life balance. Like, I'm constantly getting better. But my wife, she was the one who said to me, she goes, you know, there's a difference between being present and being present. And um, that's the thing I'm working on the most at home, putting the phone down and being present. Good luck. Thanks. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed the party back in the day. <laughs> Thanks. This has been awesome. Uh, I'm curious... Do you think you could have been as successful had you pursued a completely different path? Like, how much of your success is attributable to your passion for, for music and your craft as opposed to just your inherent drive? I mean, I don't know. I know that I didn't go into life being like, you know what, I want to do music. Um, I just wanted to be an entrepreneur. And that's the way I've always kind of considered myself. And I read a book about David Geffen where he said music was the fastest way in because music takes a night and movies and TV and entertainment take years, but a one song can change your life in a night. I was like, eh, I'm in Atlanta, let's go. Um, but I, uh, I don't know what my life would have been. I think there's so many points in my life I look back and think if I would have turned that way instead of that way, what would have happened? You know, if I would have stayed in that relationship, what would have happened? Like, you know, there's so many different ways I look at it. All I know is I thank God every day I wake up and this is where I ended up because I'm 36 years old and. Whenever I get depressed, the one thing I remind myself of is I'm like, if you put my life against any 36-year-old on the planet, I'm going to take my life. Like, I'm going to choose this. Like, this is good stuff for 36. I'm working with this. This is fine by me, except for the Jets. We never win. <laughs> <laughs> I see you with the Steelers shirt. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Oh, this is great. And I actually listened to you on Simmons as well, so I'm one of your three basketball fans. Nice. Uh, yeah. That was uh, fun with Bill. It was, yeah. Was, he's got to show up in my pickup game now. Yeah, and there's nice, not too much overlap today. Um, curious, you said that you, Facebook was kind of like the one that got away on the tech side. Curious if there's something on the artist side. Oh, I saw this person. They didn't come with me. That kind of thing. Um, I mean, there's a bunch of different ones, but I don't really, it's like Facebook. I don't have really regret. I feel like it just led me one way to another. I mean, a funny story is I knew Macklemore before he blew up. Um, we were friends, and I knew about him in Seattle. And um, he had the mixtape, and it was just all the hits, but it wasn't out yet. And he sent it to me, and we were talking, and I was just like, is there any way I can get you to sign you know, over here? And he said, look, the only person I would sign with is Drake. So I hit up Drake, and I'm like, you should do this. And he's like, OK, hit, and tells me one of his guys you know, to hit who he trusts on the A&R side. And, um, Drake and I weren't in business the way we are now, um, but we were friends. And his guy just didn't pay attention and passed. And when Macklemore's album went number one, they were like, don't tell Drake. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, you know, I, like I said, I wake up and I look at my life, like I don't want to look back and have regrets. I think the only thing you should have regret about is things that you do that were malicious. Like missing out on stuff or anything like that. Like I don't have regrets, like that's part of the journey. But if you do something malicious, I'll tell you something I have regret about. I was at basketball camp when I was in seventh grade or eighth grade, like a sleepaway camp. And these older kids, a year older than me, they were real cool. And they were like, come hang with us, because I was, I was good. And they were like, man, this kid in our hall, he's a dork. He's a, and I'm like, dork? I'm a dork, but OK. Um, and they like broke into his room while he wasn't there. They put all his shorts on the ground. They're like, Scooter, pee on it. And I knew it was wrong. But these older kids were like peer pressure in me, and I 
peed on this poor kid's clothes. And um, the camp gets reported. Kids having to have to wear you know his bathing suit to play in the you know, stuff because there's pee and and I just felt so bad. I was like, screw these kids. So I went up to him and I said, I did this to you. I'm so sorry. Screw these kids. I reported myself. They didn't let me play in the All Star game even though I had made the All Star team at the end of the week. And to this day, even though I made it right, kind of, I never forgot that because I was like, that's regret. I knew better. Like, I shouldn't have done that. But everything else in my life, if I missed out, I missed out. I wasn't, I didn't do anything bad. Shouldn't have peed on his clothes, man. <laughs> what seventh grader does that? Also, his mom, he didn't tell his mom that we made good. So I didn't tell my dad what happened. He didn't understand why I was in the All-Star game. And the last day of camp, the parents come. And the mom, I'm sitting there, and she comes out, you disgusting little kid. How dare you pee on my son's clothes? I'm like, what? And he's like, no, mom, we're good now. We're good. And my dad's like, what are you doing? And I was like, I don't, I don't know, dad. <laughs> and, 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 then, and then he goes, how dare you say my son? And she goes, he peed. He goes, he did not pee. Tell him. And all of a sudden, he looks at me, and I'm like, and he goes, oh, you're dead. <laughs> and uh, I just, that was not a good interaction with my dad at that time. Co Coach Braun was not happy with me. <laughs> Hey, Scooter, uh, question. Uh, what are conversations at the dinner table like with your family? Uh, the Emmanuels tend to have very, uh, they bring their work to the table. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, and their narrative reminds me a lot of your family's as well. So I was curious if your family has a similar So question, uh, do you want to know like what it was like growing up or what is like now? Let's do the growing up. Yeah. Growing up, um, it was very important to my parents that we sat down at the table and had you know, a family meal. And my parents were nine to five because my dad was a coach and then he was a, a dentist and my mom was an orthodontist. So, you know, they could be home every single night kind of when work was done. And it was always important for us to sit around the table and have a conversation. And me and my brother um, were very competitive and like we get into fights because we were only two years apart. But if we fought too much, then dad got involved and he was bigger and stronger and fights better. Um, but it was very much challenges. You know, extremely competitive challenges. Me and my dad were definitely the loudest. My mom, when she spoke, everyone shut up and listened because she was like the quiet boss. Like my dad would talk a lot, but if my mom spoke, it was like, okay, that's, we're done now. Um, but it was always, what did you do today? Very competitive, kind of pushing each other, but also a tremendous amount of love. Like it wasn't, you know, there was, there was high praise. We were appreciated for our achievements. And we were always told every night before we went to bed, my dad used to come in our room as long as I can remember and say, hey, bronze are different. And we were like, what does that mean? And he always said, it doesn't mean you're better than anybody, but you're different and I hold you to extraordinary standards because I think you're extraordinary. And after a while, you begin to believe the propaganda. So we went into life just believing that we could do anything because he had ingrained that into us. Um, what our conversations are like today uh, is... Um, Levi has a, uh, will usually say, I, <laughs> I, uh, daddy, mama, go. Uh, Jagger uh, has a new song called Onion Man. Uh, the lyrics are Onion Man, Onion Man, Onion Man, Onion Man, Onion Man, over and over and over again for about half an hour. Um, Sample that. And then my wife and I are just trying to have a conversation while they're awake. And then we usually talk once we get them down to sleep. But um, actually, I'll tell you a good conversation about my wife because I haven't spoken about her a lot today. But I want to give you an understanding of why I am the way I am. Um, so she didn't want to date me because I was in the entertainment industry. And I saw her TED talk on fuck cancer and it made me want to meet her. Um, and I had to trick her into a date when I found out she was single like a year later. Um, How'd you do that? Well, she thought she was going to drinks with a bunch of people. When she showed up, it was just me. And I had my, <laughs> I had my friend set it up. Um, and then, like, the first date, like, kind of fell in love pretty quickly, and that was that. Uh, but now we're together for a while, and I think some of you in this room might have heard that Justin Bieber had a turbulent time in his life. Um, things weren't always so easy for the young man. Um, and that was a very, very hard, about a year and a half, two years. And one day, you know, he and some other clients were going through stuff, and it was just like four days of just really bad stuff. 
And I was bringing it home night after night after night. We're getting to bed. I'm bringing it home. And um, she is just like, look, you can't keep bringing this to bed. Because I'm just like, it's, I'm, I'm not getting any of you. Like, you got you to gotta cut it off when we go to bed. And in the classic entertainment prick move, I respond with, look, you have to understand this is what I do for a living. You don't appreciate what I do. This is how I provide. This is like, this is how I'm able to, you know, do everything. And my wife looks at me and she says, okay, cool. You're right. So I was helping someone with chemo today. I'm going to bring that to bed. And um, I shut up, realized instantly how much I loved her and said, I love you so much, thank you. Because my wife is the number one person who introduced in my life the difference between problems and inconveniences. When we work in this world of tech or entertainment or wealth, um, you tend to think that what you're doing is very, very important. And 99% of the stuff I deal with is inconveniences, high class inconveniences, but inconveniences. And what my wife deals with is problems. And I think she taught me the difference, so it's given me perspective. It's awesome. Can I throw it? Good. You guys are very athletic. <laughs> Everyone has perfect throws, no one's dropped. <laughs> First you of sign all, up to the Jets? Yeah, you're, yeah we need you. <laughs> um, I appreciate you being very honest and candid and not scripted. I like all the stories you've been telling. Um, so a lot of people like the entertainment industry and all its fame and glory and wealth, and a lot of people want to stay far away from it because of all the egos. Um, in your journey through the entertainment industry, what have you learned to really like about it, and what have you really hated about it? Um, what I like about it is most of the stuff I would do that I get paid for, I would actually do for free. I like to be able to go to a show or help someone make a record or make a TV show or a film or, you know, you know, advise someone on a tech deal. Like, that's fun. You know, most of that stuff I would do for free. The bullshit is what I get paid for. You know, the stuff that I hate, the inconvenience versus problems and people not understanding the difference. Um, but the hardest part... Uh, does that answer the good part good well enough? Um, and also, like, when you're in an elevator or when you're in a restaurant and the background music is a record that you are a part of, that's actually a really cool feeling. Because, like, you're not really paying attention. You're like, why do I know this? And all of a sudden, you're like, oh, I helped put this together. That's pretty damn cool. Um, or I just made 25 cents because I have the publishing. <laughs> um, uh the hard part is knowing your truth. You know, it's, and I think it's highlighted entertainment because it's so high profile, but knowing your truth is really the hard part because people that even I think know my character that have gotten to know me have been like, you know, because of their own issues or whatever, they will like call you out on your truth and say, well, I think like you're, you're in it for the wrong reasons or, you know, I, you know, they'll, they'll kind of put you down. They'll, they'll project their negativity onto you. Um, and because I decided early on, okay, I want to build a brand that I can build off of, I did put a target on my back. And having to know who I am and what I stand for and what I believe in and who I love and who loves me has been the greatest challenge of holding on to that so I don't get lost in other people's expectations and not even expectations, their projections of what they want to see to make themselves feel better. Um, and understanding that you don't have to be friends with everybody, you can be polite to everyone, you can be kind to everyone, but you're not going to change someone. If they want to project that negativity onto you, you have to just be okay with it and know it's not your truth. And, and in my industry, it's very, very hard sometimes to not get lost in the amount of negativity that exists people want to people want they're not happy for each other they want to break each other down they don't want they want to count your money and your success and hope that you fail and um right before we got on the stage i was joking because we were talking about you know people's success and i said look my thing is i hope everyone's successful because i don't want to pay for your vacation i want to i want to go on vacation with you and i want you to pay for your own vacation <laughs> like do you know what it's like to bring friends on vacation that can't pay for their vacation it's very frustrating <laughs> So, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm telling you, like, if, if, so, if we can go all on vacation together and everybody stands on their own too, it's great. So I, I don't really, I want everyone to be successful. I, I really, like, one of my buddies just launched his own company and finally left an agency after, I think, 12 years. I couldn't be happier for him. Like, I'm rooting for him from, you know, the top. And originally, he wanted to come in, and I was going to get 50% of the company and fund it. And then he changed his mind and goes, look, you'll be my first investor if I need it, but I don't think I need funding right now. And another friend was like, are you upset? I was like, no, he's doing what's right for him. Like, I want him to win. And at the end of the day, if he becomes successful, he buys dinner. <laughs> so I think it's just not getting lost in that's the hardest thing. You got to throw it all the way over there. You got this. You got this. You got this. Yes. Wow. I'm telling you, oh, this is and incredible. I'm, I'm British, so we don't, we don't catch things like that. <laughs> we, just, we just run away. Use um, your feet. Yeah, uh, big feet, tall arms. Um, it's interesting hearing you talk, because you said you've always wanted to be an entrepreneur, but when the way you talk about your life, it doesn't seem like your primary goal has ever really been about business or about money. It sounds as though you've wanted to go on a journey that's allowed you to uncover what is valuable in life for you, and now you've reached that point. Do you, would you say that's true, or...? Yeah, but I, um, God, you guys got me telling so many life stories. <laughs> um, so when I was a kid, we moved from uh, like the Bible Street Park area to this house like out in the boonies. And this guy from Greenpeace showed up at the door. And um, he asked us for money, explained everything. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. He's going to save the world. And I went and got my mom. I was like, we should write him a check. And she's like, look, we give to charities, but like, you can't just give money to every single person. We've got to pay bills and put food on the table. And I was like, no, mom, it's amazing. Give him a check. So I convinced my mom to give him like whatever check it was, 25, 50 bucks, like to support Greenpeace. And he starts to leave. And I'm like, where's his car? And my mom's like, he doesn't have a car. Part of the cause, he's walking from house to house because he's supporting the environment. And I was like, but we don't live near a bus station or a train station like he's going to be walking for miles my mom's like yeah that's part of it and i was like this guy's amazing <laughs> but in that moment i was like if my mom doesn't write him a check he's just a dude walking from house to house he's too reliant on the check and i always like to figure out ways to skip steps and that was when i realized very young that money was an avenue to freedom and as I got older and got to witness a lot of people with money, I realized a lot of people don't understand that and it ends up trapping them even more. But I think being an entrepreneur allows me to do everything that you're describing. Um, and that's why I've always wanted to have financial freedom and success because I don't ever want to be limited or have my dreams or my passions or my wants for this world to be blocked because I can't get a check from someone. Um, and I'm seeing it now. Like uh, We did the telethon last year called Hand in Hand where we raised money for the victims of the hurricane. And being able to go out and do that because of the power I had as an entrepreneur, that was liberating. Um, and then people gave money. Um, but it's, uh, I agree with you. I, don't, I think if I didn't look at it that way, if I, if I, the word entrepreneur is funny because you know, we think, oh, it's someone who wants to make a ton of money. But ask that person what they want to do with the money. You know, and if they don't know what they want to do with the money, I think they're a pretty shitty entrepreneur. <laughs> I just know what I want to do with it. I want to, you know, provide for my family, my friends, and I want to be able to make an impact in the world. Because in 100 years, no one's going to remember me. I don't think anyone, no one's going to remember any of us, to be honest with you, in 100 years. But I think they'll feel our impact. So I want to be able to have as much capital as I need to create impact. Does that answer it? All right, guys. That might have been the, the like realest best interview I've been a part of for Toxic Google. So thank over my you. brother, I kind of implied that I'm not saying it explicitly, but uh, <laughs> I just like repeating it. Like I said, we're very competitive. By the way, I, before I leave, um, would you mind standing up? Yes, please turn around. Everyone, please. He put together a wonderful outfit today, and I want you to give him a round of applause. <laughs> Give it up for Sanjay. Yes, thank you. <laughs> it is not that cold. <laughs> <laughs> oh, All right, this is fun. Scooter, thank you Thanks so for much for coming. Give it up for Scooter, guys. <laughs> <laughs>